Okay, so here's the update video for version 0 0.6. Uh, the new stuff in this one is all Macs for Live. There's now 16 Macs for Live devices. So it kind of covers almost all the functionality that you have in Macs. You can obviously do more stuff in Macs, but all the types of things that you can do, um, you can pretty much do them all in Live now. Um, the code base of Max has been updated completely as well. I went through and added more comments and did some tidying. I'm starting to get it like kind of ready for kind of wrapping things up. I'm starting the reference documentation, all that as well. Um, but for this update, the big stuff is the fact that there's just a ton of Max for Live devices. Um, before getting into that, I want to go over a couple definitions just to clarify some stuff because basically in this video, I'm going to show each of the types of things that you can do and just demo them all in, in live. So the first thing is classification. So classification, if you're coming from sensor percussion stuff, is basically the zone training. So we're going to train a classifier by saying, this is the center of the drum, this is the edge of the drum, this is the rim, etc. And then once you've trained the classifier, then it can recognize these things. An offshoot of that is going to be clustering, which is whereas classification in this context is supervised, where I'm saying like, this is this thing, whenever you see this thing, give me that result. Um, clustering in this context is going to be unsupervised, meaning I'll just play for a while and then tell it like, give me, break that into three types of things or four types of things or five types of things and the algorithm will separate them for you. So that's kind of like an unsupervised machine learning in this context. So uh, that's classification and clustering. They're both the same kind of thing, um, but one is supervised and one is unsupervised. Another thing is um, corpus-based sampler stuff. So this is stuff that's been central to the, the whole SP tools thing. So I'm going to analyze a corpus, meaning a body of samples. So in, in this case, it's like a folder of samples, analyze the whole thing. It analyzes a bunch of different characteristics of the sound via audio descriptors. And then when you're playing back real-time audio, it analyzes your real-time audio, finds the nearest one from the corpus and plays that back. And you have some options as in terms of how to do that. So that's like the corpus based sampler stuff. Um, a subset of that will be training a setup. So a setup in the context of SP tools is um, I'm going to be using this particular drum with these, maybe some objects, sticks or whatever. Um, uh, what a setup does, it lets you kind of find the um, descriptor space that you're using, whether you're playing loud or, or soft or the timbres that are involved. And it maps them, well, it creates a scaling of them, which you can then use to map onto the corpus. So if the corpus is very different kinds of sounds from your um, incoming sound, it'll still always find the nearest sample. Uh, when you train a setup ahead of time, it improves that matching. And I'll show a demo of that later. And then finally, concatenative synthesis, which was new in update version 0 0.4, I think. Um, but uh, to recap what that is, it's uh, like real-time audio stitching, again, in this context. So you're going to analyze a corpus, um, although in this in this situation, it'll be one single file and it analyzes every single grain of it. So these tiny little moments. And then when you're playing back sounds, it replaces them one by one and you get this kind of granular stitchy sound. So I just wanted to go over a couple definitions, just kind of review those because we're going to be doing all of those today. Now, another thing that's important to do before you go further into this is we need to update the version of Max that's inside um, Ableton. By default at the moment, it might be different by the time you watch this video, but um, what comes bundled inside of Live is Max 8.2, um, whereas SP Tools uses stuff from Max 8.3 forward, so some of the objects won't work right. So um, you don't need to own Max, but you need to do this uh, in order for your Max for Live to use the correct version. So you're gonna come to the Cycling 74 webpage, click and go to download. Um, they've, as of time of this video, they've literally just put an update today, but basically we need anything 8.3 forward. So if you've already had Max 8.3, you don't need to go ahead and download this, but I'm gonna click here and download. <coughs> I'm gonna cancel that because I, I already have it. So once you've downloaded that, you're gonna open up your Ableton um, hopefully in the next update of Ableton, whenever they go ahead and do that, it'll come bundled with a newer version of Mac. So you don't need to do this, but for the time being, um, there's features in SP tools or rather objects in SP tools that, um, use that. So you're going to come to live, you go to preferences. And then here, when you come to file folder, you'll see this max application. I've already done it. So you can see here that it shows where the max application is. Um, in your version, this I think is grayed out. So what you do is you're going to browse. And then you're going to come to applications and find the version of Max that you just downloaded and select it. Again, you don't need to own Max. You don't need to have a license for Max. 
um, but as long as you have a license for uh, Live Suite, if you do this, you'll then be using the the installed version, which is newer than that. So this is required for all this to work properly in Live. Okay, so we're here inside of Live. So along the left here is before, I've got my SP Tools uh, place. So you can see there's 16 of them now. Um, there, it's it's a lot, but some of them are just training ones. Some of them are send and receive pairs. So it's really not as overwhelming as it seems. But I'm going to go through and show you the types of things that we can do with it, and um, a couple sort of example um, live setups that I've set up here. So for this first one, I want to look at just the fundamental onset detection. One of the core things in SP Tools that I wanted to get right was really fast, really crisp onset detection. So um, for all the demoing today, I'm going to be using the sensory percussion pickup, but you can do it with a contact, a normal contact mic trigger, a drum trigger, uh, an air mic, a 58, uh, a DPA, whatever. You'll get varying results. I tend to get the crispest attacks out of the sensory percussion as well as the best machine learning stuff out of it. But I've got, uh, usually for other things, I like the DPA more. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to be the sensory percussion pickup. Um, but I got the onset detection really, really crisp, really, really tight. So <coughs> in order to leverage that inside live, you have got an audio track here set up with SP Tools onset um, send. And then I've got a MIDI track with onset receive. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through it. So when I plug it in, I'll, I'll turn it on here. Okay, so you can see I've got the, the onsets coming in um, from the snare there. I've got the track muted here because the um, audio from the sensor percussion isn't very great, so it's kind of hissy. Um, so the audio that you're hearing from the snare, I've got a, another mic off camera there that is picking that up. Um, but I've got the audio coming in, I've got it muted, and I'm sending. So um, let me mute this track here so we don't hear anything for now. So I've got the sensitivity threshold and lockout, all that kind of stuff that you have in a lot of the devices. And along the top, oops, well, that's fine, that's just things bumping. Along the top, I've got the triggers, and along the bottom, I've got the gate. Okay, and then you also see this send. So the sends here, you can have up to 127 of them. Um, they're send-receive pairs. So if you have multiple drums, multiple, like a kick drum, a snare drum, a tom, or whatever, you can set up um, on send one, and then receive one, then send two, receive two. Let me put this sensitivity a little lower here so it's not false triggering on whatever it's picking up. <coughs> um, so that's what that is. So on this track here, I have receive one. So um, when I get this going here, I have the track muted so we don't hear it, but... You can see I'm receiving, in this case, the trigger. So I can select whether I want to see re receive the trigger or the gate. So if I receive the gate, I can see the gate. You can't receive both of them. I mean, I guess you can send two sends, but it depends. The reason I put an option here is depends on what you're doing further down the signal paths. So here you select trigger. With the trigger, you can put the note length. Um, and if you set the gate, it, you just get the, the, the gate length that you get. By default, it's 10 milliseconds, depending on what you're doing further upstream, you know, you can massage that. I've got some other MIDI stuff in here to mess with that. So um, there's a tick box here for velocity. Now, when I turn this on, you can see I, uh, I get the velocity of my playing. Now, the reason why it's a tick box here is because this adds a small amount of latency. Um, this adds about, <clears throat> if you're running at 44.1K, it's about, it's about five milliseconds of latency. And the reason for that is the onset detection works really quick. There's two envelopes and they're sort of moving around together. And an onset is detected when the two envelopes diverge. So um, with that, you can tell there's an onset immediately because that has happened. In order to tell how loud that onset is, the, onset, uh, the envelopes have to diverge. And then you have to wait for that envelope to go to its peak and then come down. So you have to wait a certain amount of time for that to happen. In this case, I'm doing that over 256 samples, which is at 44.1K is roughly uh, five milliseconds. So when you turn this on, you get the velocity data for both the triggers and the gates at a slight latency. And you can see on the receive side, and you can see here in the MIDI monitor, I'm getting different velocities. Okay, so all of that's working fine. So I'm gonna unmute this here. And I'll put this back to just the normal triggers, or rather, non-velocity. 
also you can hear I'm getting, this is just a generic electric piano plug in here. So with the triggers, I'm getting that little blip. If I set it to gate, some notes are slightly longer, slightly shorter. Um, and if I set the velocity on, the same thing, I can set it back to triggers. Oh, oh no, I created a preset. Or the gates. So it's called an all, but like, what do I want with just one MIDI note? That's, you know, not super exciting. Um, now this is something that in the teaser video I did, but I did all this stuff in Max. It's much easier to do this kind of stuff in live because it's meant for this. So what I've got here, I'm gonna put this back to velocities on, that's good. I'll put it to trigger here, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I'm gonna enable a couple things here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on random. So this is gonna give me some random notes from that incoming MIDI notes, and that will sound like this. And that's, actually, I'll put a gate here so they're a little longer. That's cool and all, but I wanna maybe quantize that to a scale. So I've got the scale thing here, which is quantizing it in this case to a minor pentatonic. So in your own um, live set, you might wanna put an arpeggiator, a chord selector, use MIDI from a clip. There's any number of things that you can do with this. This is just for the demo purposes. So I've put another device here to make the note length a little longer. Um, so we get these sort of sustaining notes. And I've enabled this velocity one just to give it a bit of a velocity boost. some quite expressive stuff and again you can automate these and that's the beauty of being in live is that you can then leverage all the live stuff. So I want to show here a quick demo of um, <clears throat> since it's a send and receive pair um, for the purposes of this I've only got one drum set up here but I've set up another track here where I have um, just a audio file. This is the demo one from the um, SP tool so you would have heard this before and you can see here it's sending um, the data. You've noticed that I've put the sensitivity quite low so it's not picking up every trigger that's on purpose. I'm gonna mute this again because it doesn't sound very great but I'm sending that there and I'm receiving here. Now you can see that this is send to and receive to. So it's completely independent from the send and receive one so you can see there's nothing coming in on receive one here's all the stuff coming on receive too. So it's basically two completely separate um, onset detection things. Um, so in this case, I've got that going on. I've got the same random thing. I've got the minor pentatonic here as well, but you can see I've turned on a, a bunch of the notes. So with the low sensitivity in this here, um, what I'm in effect doing is making it so there's um, much less activity on this. So if I unmute this, turn that down a little bit. Um, I've got this kind of bass line here. Um, but it's not triggering every single note. So you can kind of adjust the sensitivity and the thing, the mini processing after it to get a kind of responsive thing. So if I put these together, um, I'll unmute this here and I'll unmute this here and I'll just have a bit of a jam. further so on this uh, on the send one here I've set up the SP tool speed so this is one of the controller ones that I showed in uh, update version 0 0.5 so um, this is mapped a few I've got the speed parameter the tempo and the variance are now mapped to a couple parameters on um, the electric piano thing so if I play you can see some of those things moving around so that just gives it another little bit of expressivity so you can combine these onset detection things with some of the more um, well, not complex, but some of the more mapping-oriented descriptor-based stuff. So if I put all that together now. Okay. 
Okay, so that's the onset stuff. So onset send and onset receive. You can have multiple pairs of these and they give you the really fast, really tight onset detection that you get with SP tools, but now just usable in your um, Ableton Live workflow. Okay, so here I have another project set up. So this one is gonna be for classification. So classification, as I explained in the opening bit, is basically the core thing the sensor percussion software does, where you can have um, a class, so here is the center of the drum, I tell it this is the center, this is the edge of the drum, I tell it this is the edge, and you give it a bunch of training examples in which you train a classifier, so when it gets new information, it will say, oh, that was the center, oh, that was the edge. Okay, so um, there's this object here, which is class train. So this one, um, is, is gonna be the case in a few of these other examples, you only really need to train once, or rather you, you get to set up a, a training that you, works for you and then you can load that file. You don't need to do this every time. And then we're gonna have a class send and a class receive, which I'll show in a second. But first I'm gonna train the drum. So I'm gonna hit learn. Um, I've already tweaked the sensitivity and all that to something that works well. Got it set to center. And um, just like with the sensory percussion thing, around 50, to 100 hits per, per zone is usually good. I'm not gonna do that many because it'll be a little boring for this video, but for your own training at home, you can be a little bit more comprehensive and get like really, really uh, much better matching than I might get here because I'm gonna be a little quick about it. So I'm gonna give it about 50 hits. stick won't do all of these I'll do some rim tip and rim shoulder I think Okay, so I've done the training and let me just check it here. So I have this little UI here that you can view on the right. Okay, that's pretty good. A couple slight false triggers there, but uh, you know, um, I was a little haphazard with the training. As I said, with yours, you can be a bit more methodical in terms of how many hits. Training all the, the zones also helps as well. So I've done that. Now I'm gonna write this to a file. So I've got a project folder here. Um, I've done one before, I'm just gonna overwrite this. So snare training. Okay, so I've done that. I, I don't need to do that again, unless you have multiple drums or wanna revisit. So um, once you've done that, you create a new project and now I have class send. So I've got the same, um, all this onset detection, the sensitivity stuff on the left, and it says drag training JSON here. So I'm gonna select the training file I just made and put it over there. Once you do that, you'll see the center percussion um, UI there. And I should get that going there. I'll adjust this a little bit here. Okay, so that, that's working there. And like with the onset one, there's, you can see there's a send and a corresponding send here. So you can have multiple of these going at once if you have multiple drums. But once I've set this up here, um, getting some kind of crosstalk there. As before, I have this muted just because the mic doesn't sound very good. So the audio you're hearing is from a different mic. Um, put that sensitivity up a little bit more. Now on this receive, so I'll turn this on. I'll, I'll, I'll mute the track just for now, just so we can see stuff. So if I play the center. Getting some slight false triggerings there. Okay, so that's decent enough. As I said, you can be a little bit more methodical with your training. So um, this will send by default, um, starting from C1 all the way to B flat one, it'll send the default um, like drum MIDI mapping or uh, a drum rack if you're using live. So if you play the center, that'll come in for the, I guess what's typically the kick. If you play the edge, that'll come what's normally like a clap or an auxiliary type sound, etc. So um, that's very useful. So you can pick 
well, for one, you can use it right with, with a drum rack right away. You can adjust the order of the notes if you want them to be different things. So if I want this to be C, I can, you know, change that to C, but I'll just put it back to C sharp for one. Um, the note length you can alter, but in this context, if particularly if you're using a drum rack, the note length doesn't matter because I'm triggering the sample for its duration. So um, this is just a, one of the built-in drum racks that I've set up here. So if I unmute this, So you can see that that's triggering the samples. So um, you can be a bit, you know, more creative with what you do here. But I've, I've mapped, um, well, I've trained a, a bunch of classes. So I have a classifier that's trained up, and I've got some samples set up here. So I'll just have a quick little jam on it, so we can hear what this sounds like in context. <laughs> Okay, so that's what it is with a classifier. So I want to be specific about this is the center of the snare, this is the edge of the snare. This is how you train that up. And like with the onset stuff, you can have multiple of these. If you have multiple drums, you can have your snare training, your tom training, your kick training, etc. So that's the class stuff. So here I've got another project. For this one, I'm doing clustering. Now, as I explained in the opening, clustering and classification are both classifiers, but um, in this case, I'm not going to be specific about I want the center. This is the center of the drum. This is the edge of the drum. I'm just going to play some random, well, not random. I'm going to play some stuff and tell the computer find patterns within that. So I've got this cluster train, then I've got cluster send, and then I have a few receive. So I'll actually explain that in a moment. Um, but for now, I'm going to create a, uh, a cluster, a classifier from the clusters. I'm going to, I'm going to create a training from uh, using this cluster train. Uh, for this one, I'll just put a couple objects on the drum just to kind of make it a little bit more exciting. Um, I'll hit reset, and I'm just going to play a bit. So I did about uh, 225 hits there. At first, I, you kind of saw I did them in an order, but then I just sort of played things randomly. They don't have to be, you don't have to do all of the one type of sound in a row. You literally play whatever you want, however much of you want. When you're done, you're going to select the amount of clusters that you want to create. So in this case, I'm going to tell it, give me three. And you'll see the display, will, uh, it'll change and we'll get three clusters. So here, I've got a yellow, a green, and a red. If I want it, I can tell it, give me five, or eight, or two. Or one. A one isn't very useful because it'll just do nothing. Oh no. Yeah, there we go. Um, so the, the more hits that you do, the better it'll be. So you can see that it's kind of it's taken the descriptors that it's analyzed and it's created a space, then found the nearest matches. So these one red ones and those two yellow ones, you can see kind of sort of belong to slightly different ones, but it it's this is what it found and this is what works the best for what it found. Um, usually, the more clusters you want, the, the higher amount of hits you want to give it. For this example, I'm just going to use three. So I've got three clusters here. You'll see the UI will be slightly different, so if I hit three over and over, um, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's not a deterministic process, so the, you know, it just, that's how it works. So I'm going to write this. I'll put it here. One that I made earlier, I'll just overwrite that. So I've got the cluster training, and as before, I can never do that again. So now I've got another track here um, with cluster send. So I've got the same thing before, the sensitivity, the threshold, all that kind of stuff, which is, you'll see that in almost every object. Um, it's probably good for here. And I've got the send and receive number. So I'm gonna send on one and receive on one in this example. So drag training JSON here. So I'm gonna go here and this is the uh, clustering. So drag that on. Now you don't get a display here because uh, you, you could have selected an arbitrary amount. So with the sensory percussion type zones, there's a finite amount, there's 11, it's center, edge, shell, whatever. Here I could tell it, give me 100 clusters. 
So I'm not gonna make a UI for that, but you do get this thing at the bottom, which tells you which cluster has matched. So you can see that zero, in this case is the, the skin of the drum. The Gratales is cluster one and when I play on the rim is cluster two. Now this isn't a class, so you can see it kind of went from two to one. So it's not like in, in the classifier thing when I can say this is rim tip. Um, here I've played a bunch and it found, the, the, it found that this sound was close enough to be considered the same. That's just what the algorithm found. Depending on what you play, the objects that you're using, your snare, you get different clusters depending on what you've done. So I'm sending this out here. So for this example, I've actually set up something a little bit um, zestier here. So I have the receive, I have three receives. So um, by default here, I've got this receive one. And if I just start playing, uh, everything's muted. You can see match cluster zero. One and two. So this is working here. Now I'm doing a little bit of funny business here, which I'll explain. So I've put a scale object and I've made it when there's a C, it'll pass a C and there's nothing else or with anything else, it won't pass it through. So if you look at the MIDI monitor, um, I'll only get when I play the skin. If I play the this or that, nothing is reaching the MIDI monitor. So essentially I'm basically filtering out everything that isn't uh, in this case, cluster zero. And now I'm taking that, putting that into a random thing and sending that to a percussion kit. So if I unmute this track here, we should hear. So I've set it to do kind of random things here from this, this is another one of the like factory um, presets or whatever. Um, so when I play a note on the skin of the drum, so cluster zero, it's playing a random sound from this uh, drum. Uh, whatever, the drum set thing. And it's playing it with the velocity which, uh, which is the class is being identified with. So I'll mute this one here. So on receive two, you can see it's the same. I'm receiving on instance one. Um, it'll tell me the match cluster. Um, and now with a scale object, I've set it to C sharp. So when a C sharp comes through here, it'll get passed on and nothing else will. So if I play the skin, nothing happens. If I play the rim, nothing happens. But when I play the cretale, you can see in the MIDI monitor that stuff's going on. And then after this, I've done the same thing. I put a random thing. In this case, I've, I've set it to, to a scale and put it to a kind of a, like a melodic, uh, the collision device here. So if, if I play a bit of that, oh, no, that's loud. Okay, and now for the third one, I've done the same exact thing. So I'm receiving stuff here. When I get a D, I'm passing that along. I'm making a random thing. I've got a scale and I'm uh, put this into a different uh, synth here. So when I play the rim, I'll get this. Turn that down a bit. So um, what I'm getting with this example is something similar to something that I had set up in the teaser video where depending on what part of the drum I play, I get very different behaviors. Here I'm doing something similar, but using Live's version of that. So if I'm playing on the skin, I'm setting it to one synth. If I'm playing on the, the cretale, I'm setting it to another synth. And if I'm playing on the rim, I'm setting it to another synth. So if I unmute all of them, I get something like this. That's clustering. Um, what you can do this with uh, the classifier as well. It doesn't make sense because you can connect, connect that directly to a drum rack. In this case, it's since it's just receiving one note, I'm using that to kind of fork it using the scale of uh, the scale MIDI processor to do different processes. Um, but clustering is really interesting in that you can play whatever you want and have the algorithm find stuff. So I find it to be, I kind of like that almost more than the classifier stuff, but both of them have their time in place. So if you want to trigger a specific sample, a specific time when you hit a like the rim, 
use a classifier. If you want to just have this sort of expressive thing when you do certain types of sounds, then the clustering is a bit better. Um, so that's clustering. Okay, we've got another project here. So this is the corpus example. Um, so this is one of the, the core things that I wanted to do with SP Tool stuff, and it's, it's uh, what I personally find the most interesting in terms of uh, performing, where you can have like a large sample library and then play it instead of being like, when I hit this one spot, I get this one sample. That's super cool if you're doing like, like an 808 kit or something like that, but if you have like thousands of samples or hundreds of samples, um, it gets a little tedious to one-to-one -one map them. So um, for me, this is what I find most interesting is just being able to take a, a sample library analyze it and then be able to play it with uh, the timbral qualities of, of my drum in this case. So um, as with the uh, classifier stuff, I've got a, a, a create one. So it's not a training one, I'm gonna create a corpus and then I have uh, the corpus match. So here I'm going to, um, there's a few corpora that come installed with the SP tools, but here I'm gonna create one. I'm gonna show you through that. So I'm gonna load something here. I'm gonna go to my samples folder uh, large libraries. So I've got this test library which has a whole bunch of um, different bits from different uh, sample libraries, some metal resonance, some uh, gamelan, I think there's some water phone stuff in here. Just a little bit of this, this and that. So I'm gonna hit open. Um, it's gonna prompt me to name stuff. So I'll say test library. I think this is a small one. Oops, that's uh, me. Test library small. Um, mix of different sample libraries. If you want, you can put this optional stuff on the right. Um, I've done it for all the examples, but it, it's not necessary. It's just useful metadata for yourself. So I hit OK, um, and this will go crunching in the background. If you're in Max, you do see a counter thing running down. If I, in fact, I right click here um, and open, show open, open Max window. Um, you can see it running through the samples here. So, um, Whilst that's doing, I'll just show you a little bit of, well, I'll, we'll just sit here and wait actually. So um, it's analyzing each individual file for a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, there we go, it's done. This is a small library. I'm gonna load when I do playing a little bit of longer one because otherwise it'll be a little boring for the video. So this had about, uh, what, 50 samples. When it finishes, it shows me all these um, statistics here. So the minimum duration was a second and a half. The longest file was five seconds and then a bunch of other stuff about it. So that's useful that you can use uh, in Max or if you're doing other stuff. For the purposes of what we've done here, it's, it's not really relevant. Um, the main thing is you put it to load, it'll crunch in the background, and when it's done, you'll get this little map display. That took like 30 seconds, and this is about 50 samples. I have one, the example I'm gonna use now is about uh, 2,000 samples, and it took 15 minutes. So depending on the computer speed, my computer's very old, uh, it may go quickly, but once you've loaded it, if it's taking a while, you can click and show uh, Max Window to see what it's doing. Um, but otherwise, uh, just hang tight and it'll it'll be done when it's done. So I'll hit here and hit right. I'll put this on the desktop and I'll put, um, yeah, test corpus. I'll just save it as that. Okay, so I've done that and this you only need to do once. So now I've got corpus match. So I'm gonna drag a corpus here, and like with the other ones, I've got the sensitivity stuff. And this one I demoed a bit in the version 0.5, but it's been updated a bit and it's got some new features and stuff. So I'm gonna show you this. For the in this example, I'm actually gonna load the bigger version of, of that metal library. So I've got one here that um, has like all uh, 1700 samples. So I'm just gonna put this to load. That'll take a second, because it's uh, quite a few samples. And again, as a point of reference, on my computer, that took about 15, 20 minutes to analyze. So this is all those samples. So uh, I've got, got it muted for now, but if I play, let me take this, actually, I'll leave that stuff on there. I'll adjust the sensitivity, and the threshold and all that. Oh, duh, I'm gonna do this stupid thing. I'll put this. Up a little. As before, I've got it muted because we don't really want to hear this. Actually, I'll unmute it because we do have, um, well, we're going to hear samples here in a second. All right, so that's coming here. So I can adjust the, the blend so I can hear just the sensor percussion pickup. So that sound great. Or I can put it to just hear the samples. 
Okay, so this is a big sample library of about, as I said, about 1700 samples. And it's taking, uh, it's mapped out in a descriptor space, which is this visualizer you can see here. And now I can just play audio into it and it'll use audio descriptors from what I'm playing in to play the nearest one to what I'm playing, both in terms of timbre and volume. Okay, so that's playing the nearest thing. And then here I've got a bunch of um, parameters for adjusting the, the built-in sampler. So the playback speed is exactly what it seems like. Um, then the start and end, or start and length rather, are the like what part of the sample it's playing. So by default, it'll play 100% of the sample. So if it's a long sample, it'll play the whole of that sample. But if I wanna shorten things up, I'll put this to let's say like 10%. You hear it plays, but then it kind of stops suddenly. So that's where this hold and attack. So this starts doing a fade out. And similarly, if I want to cut the beginning off, so I'll just turn this up a little bit and I'll put a bit of a fade in. And you apply curves to them as, as you can with a lot of the other things. But for now, I'll just put this back to um, the default settings, which is that. And you do have this option here to apply the loudness compensation and spectral compensation, which I explained in one of the older ones, but to summarize, um, when these are set at zero, when I play, it's gonna find the nearest match in this corpus, so the body of samples. Um, but it won't be exactly the same. So for example, the loudness, let's say I played something that was like negative 20 dB, the one that it found was negative 18 dB. So it'll play that sample, because that's the nearest one. What loudness compensation does is if I turn this up all the way, in this example, so let's say I played negative 20 dB, the one it found was negative 18 dB. What this will do now is it'll play it back 2 dB louder. So it'll find the nearest match, but then it'll adjust the loudness to better match. So this will give you more expressive dynamics with the sampling that you've done. So it'll still find the nearest match within the corpus, but then adjust it. And spectral compensation does the same, but with like kind of like a matching EQ. This um, works okay with the center percussion pickup, but because the pickup itself sounds kind of tinny, it applies that EQ to the sample. So um, I like this a lot when I'm using the tool dual pickup setup, which you can't do in live, but where I'm using the onset detection from the center percussion pickup, and then let's say using a DPA, so I'll do the spectral compensation with the DPA. Um, that sounds really good. This still sounds fine. It gives you a bit more like nuance and detail. Okay, and now there's this little expand box here. So this gives you some, I guess, advanced options. So I'll put everything back to default here. So round robin is the round robin selection. It's, it's with a library this big, it's unlikely, but if I play the same exact sound over and over, if I turn that off, it's hard because there's so many samples here for me to hit exactly the same type of thing. But if I was to hit the same exact sound, like mechanically, um, it would play the same exact sample. When you turn round robin on, it'll play a selection from the nearest cluster, which is not cluster, it'll from the nearest zone. So it just, it avoids uh, having that sort of machine gun thing like it would in a, a normal sampler. Um, voice stealing in voices is what happens. So in, by default, it's 16 voices, so 16 voice polyphony. Um, one thing that I actually really like doing is I'll put this to one voice with voice stealing on, and then I have this kind of uh, like cymbal choke group type sound, but for which for me sounds really interesting with these long sustaining samples. It sort of has that real artificial sound. If you turn voice stealing off, a new sample can't trigger until the previous sample has finished. Which is kind of cool if you want something that happens every so often. Um, so this will give you just kind of some advanced options there. Uh, the time scale stuff, I won't explain in too much detail here, but this um, determines what aspect of the corpus you're, you're matching. 
Um, so whether you're doing, uh, by default, everything in, in SP Tools analyzes a very tiny window, so about five milliseconds, it's analyzed the corpus for this. And you're playing, it's analyzed five milliseconds, and then it's matching the nearest one to that. But I could tell it instead, match to the medium time scale. So it'll, it'll analyze, well, the corpus has already been analyzed, but it'll take the nearest, uh, your real-time audio, and find the nearest match in a slightly bigger chunk of audio. So all this is nice and expressive and it works really well, but I'm gonna go one step further here. So I've set up this, uh, a, a third track here with setup train. So a setup in the context of SP tools is something that um, lets you, if you're gonna use this if you wanna use corpus stuff and get real uh, detailed with it, or if you have a corpus and an input sounds that are very dissimilar. So in this case, I've got um, snare sounds, which are very dry and kind of dark and timbre, and I have a bunch of bright metal sounds. That might be the case if you've got a bunch of bass synths or tambourines or hand claps or whatever it is that you have. If your timbral space is very different, it's useful to train a setup. So to train a setup, it, it's very similar to training a cluster. So I'm gonna reset this here. Uh, all of this should be working fine. Let me mute this other stuff. Um, and if I played, let me just make sure it's working. Adjust this a bit more here. Okay, so it's getting that, I'm gonna reset again. So I'm just gonna jam on my setup. So here I've got some crotales, I've got this, I've got just wooden sticks. So I'm just gonna play the drum for a little bit. Uh, with this, it's important that you play at different dynamics as well. So as loud as you're gonna play, as soft as you're gonna play and everything in between. Okay, so I've done about 200 hits there. I'm gonna hit done. So it's gonna plot that in a space here. So already this is great. I can take this training and I can apply it in corpus match and it'll improve my um, matching overall because it'll take the descriptor space, so how the, the highest centroid I have, the highest loudness, um, the statistical like spread of these, and it'll take that and scale it to the corpus. But I'm gonna go one step further here. So I explained this in uh, version 0.2 update, but what there's this section here at the bottom says train. I'm just turn it on and let it start crunching away. You'll see that um, Ableton's CPU is gonna go kind of a bit crazy here. But what's happening now is that it's training a neural network. So there's a neural network inside of this um, device here. And it's taking, uh, when I was creating the setup, it was, analy it was recording the tiny little five millisecond chunk and then also analyzing a hundred millisecond chunk. And then for the neural network, it's just feeding these and it's saying, when it gives me this, do your neural network magic stuff to give me that. And it's doing this on the whole set of them. So you can see it kind of was doing nothing for a bit and then it's sort of dropping. Um, I think in, in that video, I say that I let it run for a few minutes. I think with this type of audio, the best uh, loss was around 0 0.9, 0 0.8 that I got. The number here will vary depending on the type of the amount of hits that you're doing, the type of sounds that you have and the amount of time it takes will vary on your computer. As I've said many times, my computer is really slow, so on yours this will be faster. Oh, so loss 0 0.10, that's good enough for now. So I'm gonna hit stop on the training. Um, so now I've, I've created the scaled descriptor space and I've trained the neural network. So I'm gonna write this here and I'm gonna call this setup. All right, so I've got corpus match here. So I've got all those features that I showed you before. Now there's this bottom here that says drag setup here. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my setup file and drag that onto there. So it's loaded and now I'm gonna enable setup match. So in doing this, now the, the spaces will be spread onto each other. So um, I'll kind of just show an example of what it sounds like without it. Again, the, this varies on your input sounds and their corpus. In this case, there's a lot of bright metal sounds. So by default, I get this. And I've enabled the setup match. It 
slightly improved here. I, I find I get the be better results for this when I have, let's say like the voice corpus is really good because there'll be low bassy sounds. Nothing I can do with this snare is low and bassy. Um, here I can play the, the rim and get kind of high bright sounds, but I can't go down very much. So, but it, it scaled it to, to do that. And now once I've done that in here in the time scale, I can set it to predicted. So when I do that, it's using the neural network by analyzing the short tiny window and using that to predict what the rest of the sound was gonna be based on the training that I gave it. And then it'll find the nearest match using the, a mix of the real time audio or the real audio analysis and the predicted audio analysis. So um, if you wanna be real, get the best results out of corpus match, you'll create your own corpus, you'll create a setup, you'll drag it here, you'll enable setup and you put predicted. This will give you the most uh, overall expressivity that you'll get with that particular corpus. And as with before, you can use any other controller-based stuff to, to you know, map these. So for example, it's, it's quite musical to have, um, let's say like speed or descriptors and use that to modulate the starting of the start of the sample. Because to start from that, you get a really sharp attack with most of these metal sounds. So if you start, you know, have this modulated based on your playing, that can sound really nice. Um, so yeah, there you go. This is the corpus-based stuff. So this lets you um, have a large sample library, create your own, or use a bunch of the examples here. Oh, one thing that's really improved in this version, um, before, if it didn't find the sample folder, it would just, you would see the visualizer, but nothing would play. Now, if the samples have been moved or their things are wrong, um, it'll look one more place for it. And then if it doesn't find the samples again, it'll pop up a window and say, where are the samples? So um, that should help for people that have had issues with uh, it finding the samples. So that's the corpus-based stuff. Okay, and here's the final one that I'm gonna show for today. So this one, I'm not gonna go into a massive amount of detail with it because it doesn't work uh, super great with straight percussive sounds. This is something that uh, works nice with gestural continuous sounds um, and works quite well in Max when you can start building stuff around that. But I wanna show how it works because there's devices for it now um, in live. So there's this Corpus, uh, sorry, Concat Create and then a Concat Match. So I've got a Concat Create here. So I'm gonna create a Corpus, it's, it's a corpus as well, but um, just for the naming, I'm gonna create a concat corpus. So I'm gonna load. Um, there's a, a, one example that comes with it by default, but for now I have uh, one that I'm gonna do here. So this is just a mini version of that. So as before, it prompts, uh, this is accordion, oops, okay, stanza, accordion noise, little bit O accordion, hit okay. So um, again, depending on your computer, this is a, like a five second audio clip. So it's, it's doing it almost in real time here. Um, the actual uh, corpus or the contact corpus for this is, uh, I think it's like eight or nine minutes. It takes my computer around 20 minutes to analyze it. So this will take a bit, but you do see a, a zero to hundred percent here. When that's done, I'm gonna put it, uh, a project here. And this is a corp, uh, sorry, concat corpus mini. And I've done that and it's saved and I don't need to do anything. So I've got another track here, which uh, I believe I have. Yeah, so for this one, I'm, I've got a different mic set up here just to demo this. So um, I've, I've just have a little bit of EQ ahead of it just to do that. So if I just show you what the sound of this mic is, I'm just rubbing on the drum here. Um, I'll mute that for now. So I've got this concat match I'm gonna to go to Finder here, and here's the, uh, where is it? Concat Corpus mini file that we just created, but I'm gonna instead load uh, the one that analyzed before, because it'll sound a bit better, so I'm just gonna drag that onto here. And I'll take a moment, and it's already matching and doing its thing. Um, so let me turn that off for now. I've got a little bit of distortion on this mic just to give it a little bit of, uh, Character, whoops, unmute. Um, so that's giving me a bit more textural sound. That'll be useful for uh, matching in this. As I said, for straight percussive stuff, the concat match isn't the most useful thing. It's cool if you send the beep through it, actually. It does sound nice for that, but for individual hits, it's not the best sound, but you know, I, I want to demo it here. So I'm gonna turn that on here again. Um, let me Turn this on here and put the blend all the way to 
Okay, so if I put this to 100%, I'll just some sounds here. You can hear I get these sort of j uh, sustained gestural sound. Let me turn that mic off. Um, so as I said, not super useful for straight percussive playing, like playing with sticks. Really nice in a, in a live workflow where you're using, uh, like running a beat through this actually sounds really cool with the accordion when you get this kind of like, well, you've heard, if you've seen the 0 0.5 video or 0 0.3, whichever it was, I demo that in one of the other videos. It, it get this kind of like kind of sound, which sounds pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I wanted to demo how the two devices work. So you create a, a, a concat corpus, and then once you've done that, you can uh, match your own. One of the main differences is with this, you load a single long file, whereas with the uh, other corpus-based stuff, you load a folder of samples. But yeah, there you go. Okay, so that's version 0 0.6. Um, so yeah, it's pretty longest video by far up to this point, but I wanted to show all the max for live devices. I wanted to show what they did, and more importantly, I wanted to show on them like how to actually use them. Most of these updates videos have been like, oh, here's a new thing, here's a new thing. And I just kind of show a bit of a help us so here, like showing what devices I used, um, what I did to train them, how I how they're implemented in context in this case, in, in a live context for the, well, the for the exclusive, uh, for the whole of this video. So uh, for these upcoming um, updates from here on out, I think I'm, I'm in sort of the refining, getting things wrapped up stage. Uh, there might be a couple new abstractions, there might be a couple new devices, um, but everything else is going to be kind of smaller refinements and then a lot of just the support and documentation. I've already started it on it for Max, but I, it's, a, it's a big task, so I think it won't be until the next update, but like proper reference and help files. Well, the help files are there, but proper reference and autocomplete and all that kind of stuff. So I've started it on that now, uh, but there you go. Uh, enjoy. Let me know what you think.